We're going to turn to God's Word again, uh, and we're, we're back in the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 6, and these last few verses of Paul's letter to this church. Um, it's on page 1177, if you want to turn to it in the Pew Bibles, but the words will also be on the, on the screen. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. We know this to be true. Let me pray. Father, help us by your Spirit to understand your word this morning that we might place our trust in you and place our confidence in your promises to us. Would you open the heart, our hearts to, to, to what your Spirit would say to us and, and much more than the words of a, of, a, of a flawed man in the pulpit. But Lord, would we hear the words that you would speak to our hearts by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Somewhere in the desert of Turkmenistan is a large, gaping crater that's over 200 feet in diameter. It's about 100 foot deep, and it's on fire. That's a picture of it there. Um, its name is the Darvaza Crater, but of course its nickname is the Gates of Hell um, because of the, the, the size of it and, and, and the flames. Um, its origin is believed to have been from around 1960, caused by a drilling accident, and Soviet engineers at the time uh, smelled the emission of uh, noxious gas, uh, and so their plan was, back in the 60s, we'll set it on fire and we'll, we'll, we'll burn the gas off, and they thought it would last for a few days, but it's still burning 60 years later. It's still burning today. That, that's, those are pictures of it there. Now, some insane person uh, wanted to go to the bottom of this crater and take soil samples, so sponsored by National Geographic, they made a special suit. I don't know what out of. Um, but but, but he, he went down to the bottom of this crater uh, and he took soil samples, and this is what he said. He said, it was a coliseum of fire. Everywhere you look, thousands of small fires the sound like a jet engine, roaring high-pressure gas sound. Isn't that amazing? Um, and of course, no, no, no one knows the answer to, to the question that everyone asks. For how long is this going to burn? Is the gas ever going to run out, or is it, as some people call it, an eternal flame? So we've turned again to, to Ephesians chapter 6. I thought we were finished with Ephesians, but uh, it's amazing what jumps out at us when we read and reread uh, the Bible. Even though we've read something loads and loads of times, we never stop reading it because we always see something new in God's Word. And I was reading the, those final greetings um, that, that Paul wrote. And when, when you read Paul's letters to the churches, by the way, it, it he, he, it's usually the same sort of template. He starts it with Paul, an apostle, grace and peace to the brothers and sisters, and then he always ends it with something like grace and peace to you, or some variation of that. But this farewell that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, it caught my attention when I read it recently, uh, because it, the, 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 this is what he says, and he doesn't say this anywhere else, but he says, grace to all, who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. With an undying love. Okay, now of course, that raised a question in my heart, and I presume it might raise one in yours. What are the limits of my love for Jesus? 
Will my love for Jesus survive any and all circumstances that life will throw at me? Will my love for Jesus survive relational chaos? Will it survive physical deterioration? Will my love for Jesus survive unanswered prayers? Will my love for Jesus burn forever, regardless of what comes my way? Or might it run out of gas? Is there something that could extinguish it? Could my love for Jesus die? Now, you're looking at me like I'm the only one that thinks like that. Am I the only one racked with anxiety about these things? I really hope not. What about you? Are you sure? Are you sure that your love for Jesus will last? Can you say this morning that your love for Jesus is an undying love? And, and I say this because for some of us, we are like that roaring sound of a, of a jet engine, and our love for Jesus burns bright and hot this morning. But I also know that for some of us, our love for Jesus might be but a flicker, like a match in the wind. And wasn't that the mood of yesterday, Easter Saturday? That, 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 that strange twilight between horror and, and, and hope where, where disciples we read were broken with sorrow and, and doubt had flooded their minds and faith was but a flicker in their hearts. That day of desperately clinging to hope whilst hope seems to have been shattered. And that can be our lives, can't it? That can be seasons of our life. And so this idea of grace to those with an undying love, whenever I read it, it sounded like a very fragile thing. And so I want to think about it in light of the resurrection of Jesus from the, the grave. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus lay dead in the grave. And when the woman went to the tomb, he was not there. God raised him from the dead. But to add a nuance to that, we might want to say, God, the Holy Spirit, raised Jesus from the dead. Because we read uh, in various places in Scripture, for Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Or if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, Paul says, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, or, or, or Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. So, so Paul's writings are quite clear that God raised Jesus from the dead by the power of his Holy Spirit. Now, why would that be of interest uh, to us today? Well, uh, for those of us who, who, who were uh, here for the, the sermon series in, in Ephesians, cast our minds back to, to chapter 2, and we thought about this statement uh, from Paul whenever he wrote, As for you, you were dead in transgressions and sins. Do you remember that? And he says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive even when we were dead. And just a quick reminder about what we said about that. We said, if you're a Christian this morning, if, you're, if you know and you love the Lord Jesus, if you're walking with him at all, it's not because you were smart enough to understand the concepts of the gospel contained in the Bible. And it's not because you were brought up uh, to just accept it and, and, and imbibe it as truth. And, and it's not because we earned it or deserve it by nature of how good we are or have been. If we are in any way walking with the Lord this morning, it is only because the Holy Spirit raised us from the dead. Whilst we languished in spiritual death, unable to respond to the gospel, the Holy Spirit made us alive so that we could see and that we could believe and we could rejoice in Jesus. It's where we get the term born again from. I know that's not a very popular phrase, 
Uh, but it's where we get that um, phrase from. We were born once in the flesh, and a Christian has been born again, brought to new life in the spirit. That, that's it. And Paul says we've nothing else in which to boast. We have nothing in which we can take uh, credit. We were made alive when we were dead. And so the same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is the same Holy Spirit who raised us from the dead and into newness of life. And so if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, then neither have we. We are still dead in our transgressions. We are still in our sin. Our faith is in vain and we are to be pitied as fools. But on Easter Sunday, on on Resurrection Sunday, we gather and we affirm together and we rejoice together that God raised Jesus from the dead. He is not here, the angel said. He is risen. And so the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit who raised us from spiritual death and is the same spirit who will sustain and nurture our souls. Do you remember this from chapter 3? Again, going back, uh, and we read about this, this knowing and unknowable love, this paradoxical little statement. Paul prays that we might know the love that surpasses knowledge. So how can we know something that surpasses knowledge? And we reminded ourselves that, of course, there are things that we can do. There are practical things that we can do. We can be at worship. We, 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 can, we can read our Bibles often, uh, and we can pray to keep our minds focused. But we, we, we said together back in chapter 3 that the, the nourishment of our souls, the, the, the strengthening of our souls, comes only through experiencing something we cannot experience by ourselves. The Spirit lets us know the unknowable, which is the depth and the height and the width and the breadth of the love that Jesus has for us. That's what nourishes our souls. So among the the greatest of needs of every believer here this morning is the Spirit to refrain us from forgetting the love that Christ has for us and experiencing in our souls that, 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 that the love that is incomprehensible to, to our minds and the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit who raised us from spiritual death is the same spirit that keeps us in his love that surpasses knowledge. Now, now, just as, as an aside, it struck me, it struck me whenever I was thinking about this, uh, the church in Ephesus has actually received two letters. Um, now, we, we, one of them is the book of Ephesians, written by Paul, but the other is a letter that we find in the book of Revelation, and it's written by Jesus. And the letter is short, it features much commendation, Uh, It praises the church in Ephesus for their hard work, their perseverance. They test doctrine. They're fussy about their preaching. And then there's this line that Jesus says, Yet this I hold against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. So I want to ask you the question that I've been asking myself As far as it is up to me, am I doing what I should be doing to keep my love for Jesus alive? Am I rejoicing daily in him? Am I gathering weekly to to worship him? Do I set aside time out of my days and weeks to know him better? Bible studies, small groups, being in prayer, both corporately and, uh, and alone. Do I do those things? Or do I love other things more than I love him? Have I forsaken the love that I encountered when I, when I first believed? Have other things, have other people, have other experiences, have other goals 
taken the love that Jesus is due in my life. If that's, if that's you this morning, whether you're in the building or whether you're watching online, then the words of Jesus' letter in Revelation applies. And this is our cue. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Get back to doing the things that add fuel to our love for Jesus. But, but that was on a side. But, and and th- this is the message that I want to I share. It's been on my heart for Resurrection Sunday that an undying love for Jesus, it does not find its source in us. That Jesus is alive. Uh, and we read in, in the Bible that the good work that he began in us will be carried on by him until the day of completion. We've been singing about this all morning. And so to answer my own questions from the beginning about the security of my love for Jesus, the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that raised me spiritually from spiritual death by grace, is the same spirit that will assure me of his love for me by grace. And it's the same Spirit who will keep my love for Him alive by grace. By the same grace, He is faithful to complete the work. And when our grip of Him might begin to slip, His grip on us holds fast. It's like that old hymn. When I fear, my faith will fail. Christ will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. So there's plenty to rejoice in this morning, Resurrection Sunday. There's lots for us to celebrate And one of them is Christ is alive and he will hold me fast to himself. And so by his grace to me, his grace to you, our love for him, waver as it may, we need never worry about it being extinguished. Amen. Let me pray. Father, we we want to to, to thank you. Uh, We want to thank you for grace upon grace and mercy upon mercy. We thank you, Lord, for our salvation and our faith because it comes from you. We pray, Lord, for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit that we as believers might know life in resurrection power and maybe even, Lord, a fresh commitment to prioritize our own discipleship. Make us alive to the Spirit, we pray. Keep us strong in the Spirit, we pray. And help us not to doubt that you are alive forevermore And you will graciously keep giving us what we need to become the completed work that you have started. In the name of our risen King, we pray. Amen.